Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to North Metro Church, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before our service gets started, here are three things you need to know, highlighting some of the great things coming up for you and your family here at NMC. The women of NMC are partnering with Days for Girls, an organization that is passionate about bringing dignity to the development of young women around the world. They do this by providing Days for Girls kits filled with strategically sewn and washable cloths used for personal hygiene items. Join us on Monday, October 29th to make these kits. To register or view a list of items to donate, visit the NMC events page on northmetro.org. The deadline to sign up for complimentary childcare is Wednesday, October 24th. We believe that no one should walk through life alone because we are better together. At North Metro, our goal is that 80% of our regular attendees will be involved in a life group by the year 2020. If you are looking to join a life group, we encourage you to join our next four-week Group Connect event starting October 28th. Group Connect is designed to help you experience community in a large group while also giving you the next step to transition to a life group with those you meet. Complimentary child care is available for infants through fourth grade. Students with sign up. The deadline to register for child care is Wednesday, October 24th. The time is changing and soon we will gain an hour of rest. And parents, this means it's time for another Pajama Sunday in Town Square. This awesome daylight saving morning, children fourth grade and under are invited to wear their pajamas. Only brush your teeth and hair and we'll see you for a comfy pajama Sunday. Well, that's it for this week's three things you need to know. For more on these events and everything else happening at NMC, pick up a copy of this month's newsletter out in the lobbies. Now begin to prepare your heart for worship. Today's service begins in one minute. Good morning, North Metro. We're so excited you're here this morning. Let's stand and worship together.
Yeah. 
is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. North Metro, how we doing today? Love it. A little cold outside as it's fall. It feels good, man. We are so excited to have you with us today. My name's Justin. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and we are just thrilled that you choose to be with us today. Whether you're sitting right here with us or you're online, thank you so much. Thank you that you choose to connect with us today. We love that. We look forward to seeing you on Sundays. It's our favorite day of the week, in case you didn't know that. If you are checking us out for the first time, I just want to say hello. We hope you feel welcome. We hope you feel connected. We say around here, welcome home, and we hope you feel that way. Make yourselves comfortable. We hope you have been loved on by some of our table setters, and we're going to have a good time together. For those of you who are online, hello to you. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us today. Wherever you're at, we just love connecting with you guys and hearing some of the stories that are coming from our online service. Just thank you guys so much. I want to let you know that there is a connection card on the seat near you. And we do that because, hence the name, we want to connect with you. It's that simple. Maybe you got a question about us. Maybe you want to get connected to a group. You want to figure out how you can serve. Maybe you have some questions about faith. Just you're getting back into church for the first time in a long time. If you will fill that out and hand that to a host team member on your way out, one of our staff members will follow up with you this week. And we would love to help you get connected in whatever way you're looking. So maybe you noticed out in the hallway, if you didn't, we have uh, some nooks out there. And we intentionally built those nooks to kind of help you know what's kind of coming up and promoting some things. Well, one of the nooks out there, you might have noticed, is decorated for Christmas. Hello. Anyone already excited about Christmas? Yeah. Oh, man. I, I'm Clark Griswold. I get, I get crazy. I, I do. I love Christmas. But we have that intentionally, not because we're already celebrating Christmas, but we do a thing every, uh, we started doing this last year actually called Hope for Christmas. And I just want to tell you guys, you may not know this, last year, because of how you gave, because of how you were so generous, we were able to serve 100 families within our community. We were actually able to give them a Christmas experience last year, if you didn't know that. We gave them gifts, we gave them toys, we gave them a meal. They came by North Metro last year and were able to get these things because of how you gave North Metro. And this year, we want to hit 300 families. We want to triple last year's numbers. You guys on board me on that? Yeah. And that is for people from our community right here. We're talking just within a radius around here. We're helping these families. So when you guys give, that's what we do with it. That's the, those are the stories that are coming out of how you give on a weekly basis. So one, I hope you'll go by and see the Hope for Christmas nook at the end of the service. And two, if you give today, just know that your money, the way to think, the, the generosity you guys do, it goes to transform lives. So if you have a tithe or an offering, hand that to a host team member and you know that you're doing something to help connect people with the love of God in a crazy way. Um, if you didn't know, we've been in a series called Better Together, and that is just our heartbeat around here. You may get to the point where you're tired of us saying that, but we believe it. We truly believe that we are better together, and I can't wait for you to hear where we're going to go today. My good friend, my colleague, my team member, Daniel Hicks, is going to be speaking today, and I hope you guys are ready for that. And man, it is a great message. I, I, I can't wait to hear it again, but we have a great, great day planned for that. So before we do that, I'd love for you to say hello to one of your neighbors. And, and I guess in light of the hope for Christmas stuff, here's what I think we should do. I think it's time to confess. When do you put up your Christmas tree? Talk to your neighbor and figure it out.
right, North Metro, how we doing? Good? Who's already got their Christmas tree up? Hey, one holiday at a time, people. One holiday at a time. I love Thanksgiving. I'm longing for that, and then we'll get to Christmas after that. Well, hey, as Justin said, my name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm excited to be here this morning and talk about this idea of better together. We've been in this series about community, and we say all the time that circles are better than rows. And this week, I had a hard time prepping for this, thinking about what example do I want to give about us being better together? And I was reminded about all the ways that's been true in my life around 4 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday morning when I got a text from my brother-in-law who just, uh, his wife had their fourth baby and they were celebrating that, sent this text out. And the backstory was that she went into labor so fast that they were trying to whisk away to get to the hospital and he ended up having to deliver the baby in their bathroom with 911 on speakerphone. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's incredible. Good job, man. And then it, it made me think about all the times that uh, we've had babies, what the delivery's been like, and growing up with all these kids. And so I have three kids. Uh, my oldest is 14. And I remember the day that we had her. I didn't have her. My wife had her. But I remember being there, kind of helping a little bit. And if you've ever had a baby, you know you're in the hospital for anything that you've been in the hospital for. They come in and out like every 30 minutes, right? Checking your vital signs, you know, checking on you, make sure you need, you know, do you need anything? And it was our first time really being in the, in the hospital for any length of time. And we were like, man, they keep coming in so much, like we can't get rest here. And so they come to us finally like day two or so, and they say, hey, listen, you can stay here another day. Your insurance says you can stay another day. But if you want to go, you can go. And we're like, you know what? We'll probably get more rest at home, so why don't, why don't we leave? And so we do, and they walk us out, and the nurse kind of checks the car seat, and they let us get in the car with this brand-new baby. And we drive home, and we get home, and this brand-new baby screams for hours and hours and hours and hours. And we're beside ourselves. We're like, I have no idea what's going on. And so God's honest truth. I get on the phone. I call the hospital. Say, hey, this was Daniel Hicks. We just left with Kirsten Isabel Hicks, a brand new baby. How dare you let us leave with a brand new human? Like, we have no idea what we're doing. And uh, she keeps screaming. Like, I can't believe you let us go home with her. And so um, you said before I left that our insurance said we had an extra day. And no lie, I, I, I begged them. I said, can I come back? Can, can I come back? And they were like, uh, no, no, you can't come back. But we'll, we'll, we'll connect you to the doctor on call. And so get connected to the doctor on call. And I walk him through what's going on. She's screaming. We don't know what to do. How dare you let us leave with this new, brand new baby? There's no user guide to it. And he says this, hey, son, if she's screaming, she's breathing, you're going to be okay. And it's with this moment, she's like, hey, can I come hug you or maybe squeeze your hand really tight because that was not helpful at all was not helpful at all but thanks and then he hung up on me and the reality is here we are 14 years later uh, we're still making it still making it figuring this parenting thing out but I think every day from that day forward to today has been a journey of being better together because there's no way we can make it through this parenting thing without people in our life to come alongside of us and to help us. I mean, matter of fact, Friday night we were here for duct tape date night and this daughter that I'm talking about had a soccer game across town and we couldn't be in two places at one time so we had to get some friends to go pick her up and to bring her here to meet us because again, we couldn't be in two places at one time. But again, there's just so many examples of how we really are better together and we need deep community and people in our lives. And so you think about in your life how it's played out, you know, gifts and people helping with this and that. Like you see it all around that community is so important. But think about this. Research has showed us that community and doing life in community has really benefits for our physical health as well and health. And so in the book Outliers, author Malcolm Gladwell, he hears about this community from Rosetta, Italy. Back in the 1890s, they migrated from Italy to Pennsylvania and they established this little town, and as time goes on, he learns that this doctor in the 1950s said to a researcher, you know, I've never really experienced any heart problems or heart conditions from this little town from Italy that migrated here. And the researcher, being curious as he was, he says, let's investigate. 
And so they investigate, and here's what they say about this community. It says, this little community's population had staggeringly healthy hearts. In addition to healthy hearts, the researchers found no ulcers, no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime. Mostly townspeople were dying of old age. Man, sign me up for that. I like that right there. And then they asked a question as a researcher, but why? Was it due to some dietary practice from the old world? Not necessarily. They found people cooked with lard, ate sausages, yes. Pepperonis, eggs. Are y'all clapping already? Like, y'all like, yes, let's, where is this town? Where, let's go today. Pepperonis, eggs, sweets, and anchovies. You lost me there. In fact, 41% of other calories were from fat. And listen to this, no one was exercising. Hey, let's carpool this afternoon. Let's carpool this afternoon. And so their research like, man, what's going on? No one exercises. Everybody eats uh, unhealthy food, but yet they're all healthy. And they live to be old age. And they said, what happened? After all this research, they landed on this. This is the, the common denominator. This is what happened. They lived in community. They lived in community. Because community, being better together, is actually even better for our physical health as well. They would actually say in this research that living in community has the same physical benefits of that of quitting smoking. So again, we are better together, and there's some research right there to show us about our physical health, but today, I'm really concerned about our spiritual health. Like, how are we doing on the inside, our spiritual health? Let me read uh, 3 John verse 2 for you. Here's what an author says. Dear friend, I pray that you enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So pause real quick. If you've ever wanted to pray for, for Daniel Hicks, pray this right here, that everything's going well for me and that I'm enjoying good health, okay? Pray that prayer for me daily. But he makes this connection that, you know what? You can be healthy, but not too healthy if your soul's unhealthy. And so the way we say it is that you are only as healthy as your soul is healthy. You are only as healthy as you are on the inside, your soul the inner man, the inner woman. You are only as healthy as you are on the inside. Think about, you may be a physical specimen on the outside, but if there's something wrong in your heart, your arteries, disease on the inside, how healthy are you? You're not that healthy. And so we are only as healthy as we are in the inside, in our soul. And so this morning, I want us to diagnose how are we doing on the inside with our soul. And so here's what I want us to do. I want you to pick a neighbor, uh, favorite neighbor, least favorite neighbor, doesn't matter to me. Don't tell them which category they fall into. And I want you to turn to a neighbor and I want you to ask them, how are you doing? How are you doing? So go for it. Ask your neighbor, how are you doing? All right, all right. Don't get too far out of control. All right, so we don't have time, but if we were to go around the room and ask, hey, what were the responses you heard? It was probably something like this. Hey, I'm good, good, great, I'm fine. And because we're in church, you probably hear something like, blessed, brother, blessed, <laughs> blessed. Anybody here too blessed to be stressed? I mean, I mean, I mean that's, that's what you probably heard. Man, I am great, couldn't be better. I'm actually, matter of fact, I might have said that this morning when somebody asked me that. And I'm telling you, when I hear that response, a part of me wants to yell out baloney. Baloney or Bologna because there's a G in there. So it's baloney. And here's the deal. The reason why I say that is because how many of us are really fine? How many, how many of us are really doing so well? How many of you actually believe, man, I'm so blessed, I can't be stressed? I mean, think about it. It's church. It's Sunday morning. You know what that usually means for us? It usually means you fought with your wife and your kids this morning about breakfast. Somebody say amen. Yes. You, you fought about, hey, we're going to be late you fought with the kids, man, I told you to put your clothes on. What do you mean you can't find your shoes? You got 17 pairs of shoes, just put one on. And you get in the car, and you're all frustrated because you're, you're running late, and the guy in front of you with a North Metro sticker is driving a little bit too slow, and you're like, well, he's got a North Metro sticker, so I can't yell at him. I can yell in my breath, and I'm yelling at my kids along the way. And you're just kind of, you know, anxious, and you're getting worked up. And then you get out of the car, and you look at your kids, and say, hey, listen, you put a smile on your face. You get your act together, and you get in that house, and you love on Jesus. <laughs> and then, with all that as the backstory of this morning, which is, by the way, my wife and I, that's why we take separate cars to church. And so, with all that as the backstory, you walk up on the patio, 
get to the front door, a greeter says, hey man, how are you? You're like, bless, brother. <laughs> bless, bless. Couldn't be better. And again, I'm like, baloney, baloney. We're all liars, but the reality is, there's something about that question. There's something about us that makes us feel like we have to pretend. Pretend like, hey, it's okay. We're all good. We pretend and we hide and, and we wear a mask. And when people ask us how we're doing, we're like, hey, I can't tell you the truth. So I'm just to pretend and, and hide my stuff because if I told you the truth, maybe you wouldn't understand my story. You wouldn't understand the backstory. You wouldn't understand my circumstances. Or maybe, just maybe, you, you would judge me. And so you know what? Rather than face that and deal with some things going on inside of my soul, I'm just going to pretend. I'm going to hide some things, and, and I'm going to stuff some things. And so for me, it's kind of like, um, set that right there so you guys can see. It's like this, this junk drawer in your kitchen. Let's confess, okay? Everybody's got that junk drawer in your kitchen, right? That one drawer. You don't want anybody to see. When guests come over, you're like, hey, all those coupons, all those things, just sweep it in that drawer right there. And so you got, you got this junk drawer. And we all have it, right? Like, this has got coffee in it and an umbrella and this thing, a giraffe, scissors. There's this cord. You got to have the grill, lighter, Uno, hair, hair products, some pins, uh, I, I was actually looking through some coworkers' uh, junk drawers this past week, and I found six dollars, and I took it. Uh, actually, this was um, this actually was in my desk that someone had left from a junk drawer previously, and I just said, "Hey, finders keepers, that's mine." But we we have this junk drawer, right? And we just keep pretending, and we stuff, and we just cram it all in there, and we hide because we don't want to deal with it, you know. And it's funny when it's our junk drawer, right? But what about when it's our soul? I mean, because we pretend and we hide and we stuff things inside of our soul like anger and we stuff things like, you know, a sin or an addiction and we stuff things inside of our junk drawer and our soul like unprocessed emotions and unprocessed grief, maybe a loss of a loved one or a job or a friendship or a reputation and we just keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing and pretending and pretending and hiding and what happens is over time, we just keep adding things to the junk drawer, just adding stuff. Here's a dog brush. Here's a football tee. Stole that from my kids. Here's a basketball. Stole that from my kids. We just keep throwing stuff here. Play-Doh, sunglasses. I mean, what happens is we just keep stuffing, 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 and it starts to overflow, right? You've seen it. it. It overflows. You have that drawer, and you can't even close it anymore because it's just overflowing. And, you know, it's funny when it's the junk drawer in your kitchen, but it's not funny when it's us in the context of relationships. We start to overflow into our relationships and we start to avoid certain people because of things we haven't dealt with or the way they make us feel. It causes us to overflow or to leak into relationships where we become um, angry at someone or we become sarcastic at someone. And guys, we think that sarcasm is a spiritual gift and it's not, ask your wife. But we overflow in that way and we project on people. It makes us critical. And the reality is, the later we choose to deal with our stuff, the greater the consequences. Because we all have a junk drawer, and the later we choose to deal with it, the greater the consequences. Because one day, if you don't deal with it, it's going to become like this jack-in-the-box right here. And if you are wondering, this is the type that was on Elf. And so just want to put your mind to ease, because you were all wondering. I wondered, I googled it, and so this was... On Elf, And so our inner self, the, the one that we keep stuffing and pretending and hiding, it starts to leak out and one day it becomes like this. And I'm probably going to jump here in just a minute, so just forewarn you, because I've been practicing and it's scary. So you ready for it? You ready? You ready? You ready for it? Whew. Is that? Yeah. Like, it's funny, but that, that's symbolic of our life sometimes. We keep stuffing and stuffing, and, and we leak a little bit here and there. We're sarcastic, we're angry, we avoid, we're critical. But if we just keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing, it's going to be like this, and we're going to explode one day. We're, we're going to explode on someone around us. We're going to expl explode on a loved one, a colleague, a friend, someone here at church. And in that moment, we're going to say, man, I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from. Like, that's so not like me to blow up on you. But the reality is, it is like us because it's coming from within our soul where we keep stuffing and we haven't dealt with all of 
the junk that's in there. And so we try to manage it. We try to put sophisticated filters. Hey, I know that I've got some stuff, but you know what? I don't want anybody to know, and so I'll just manage it. I'll put a sophisticated filter. I know in this context, this circumstance, I can't say these type of things, or I can only say these things in there. But I'm telling you, that, that's not what Christ is inviting us to, to walk into. That's not what's best for us. And we have to deal with it. Because again, the later we deal with it, the greater the consequences. And if you don't think it's a problem, the people around you are feeling the effects of you leaking on them. Maybe the people around you have felt the effects of you blowing up on them because you've got something going on. And so listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 4. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the ones who reap draws a wage and the harvest a crop for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent, talking to the disciples, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The idea he puts before us is that other people are reaping what we are sowing. Other people reap what we are sowing. That means other people are feeling the effects of our soul not being worked on. Us stuffing stuff, pretending stuff, acting like things are fine and not dealing with it. Other people are feeling the effects, whether we are leaking on them or we're blowing up on them. I mean, the people around us feel the weight upon them. And the real issue is this. If we don't address the mess, we won't get any better. If we don't address this mess, so we can try to put a sophisticated filter, we try to manage this, but if we don't address the mess and do something about it, we won't get any married. better. Your marriages won't get better. Your relationships won't get better. You won't get better. When I think about that, man, I'm so confused. I'm confused. And here's why. Jesus would say this in John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I, Jesus, has come that you may have life and have it to the full. Your translation may say abundantly. Like he came to give us abundant life. Then he would go on in Galatians 5.1 and say this. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm. Do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So I, I look at those, those verses, and I look at the totality of what Christ said when he was here and what he left us with. He says, hey, I came to set you free. I came to give you this abundant life. And for me, sometimes when I feel like this is what he said and what I experienced, I feel like there's this massive, massive gap in my life. And so thinking about this massive gap, about, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, my wife tells me on a Monday, hey, on Friday, your off day, you're going to take the kids down to Atlanta Motor Speedway to get in a race car and go around the track with your kids as part of a field trip. I'm like, man, praise God, because the, the, the little me up until about eight or nine years old wanted to be a race car driver. I'm like, man, this is awesome, fulfilling a childhood dream. And so Friday rolls around, the alarm clock goes off super early. And the first thought, you know, when the alarm clock goes off, you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And so the alarm clock goes off, and I'm like, I don't want to go. Then I thought, man, you're about to go to Atlanta Motor Speedway to get in a race car with your kids. Get out of bed, Daniel. Get out of bed. So I did. I, I drive my kids down there, and I get there. It's part of a field trip. There's about 100 people there. And so I start thinking, okay, how is this going to go? How is this going to go? Like, um, are they going to put us all in race cars? We all go out there simultaneously? Surely not. Like, I didn't sign enough waivers for that to happen because that's an accident waiting to happen. So maybe they're going to put us in there one by one. We're going to go out there, and then, you know, the next car will go after I've had a few laps. It's like, if that's the case, I want to make sure I'm at the front of the line because I don't want to be waiting forever and ever and ever. And so I go to a guy who I think is in charge. I'm like, hey, you look like you're in charge. Can I, can I ask a question? How, how is this going to work? He goes, what, what do you mean? And he says, uh, well, um, I say, well, uh, how do we get in the race cars? How are we going to go around the, the, the track? And he goes, race cars? W what do you mean race cars? I was like, I'm at Atlanta Motor Speedway where race cars race. My, my wife told me I was coming here to get in a race car with my kids and go around uh, Atlanta Motor Speedway and fulfill a childhood dream. And he goes, man, there ain't no race cars. You're going to get in a 15-passenger van. And we're going to take you around the racetrack in a 15-passenger van. And he could see the look of horror on my face. And so he tried to smooth it over and make it better. He goes, hey, man, the van's going to go like 75 miles an hour. And I look back at him, 
no lie, and I said, hey, I did 85 in my Honda Civic on the way here. But the reality is there was a massive gap between what I experienced that day and what I actually thought was going to happen. I think, man, there's a, such a gap sometimes in our life between what Christ said about this life and what we sometimes experience. Like, does he really want us to go through life pretending and hiding and stuffing and leaking out over people and then one day exploding and blowing up on them? Is that really how it is? Isn't there a better way? Is there not a better way? And I think there is a better way. And so I want to look at just a real small sentence, which is a pregnant sentence with a lot of great stuff for us from Jesus' brother, James. Now, if you're new to church and trying to figure out things about the Bible and is it true, I just want you to consider that this is a line from Jesus' brother. What would it take to convince you that your brother was a son of God? Think about that. James was so convinced that his brother was a son of God that he actually would become a leader of the church and a follower of his brother, believing that he is the son of God. And so think about that for a moment. But James leads us to what I believe is a better way for us to live, to close that gap. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so he's leading us to something life-giving in a better way in its confession. Con confession is cleaning out the drawer. Confession is emptying out the drawer, not just trying to manage it, but confession is cleaning out the drawer and it's leading to our healing. It's reminding us you don't have to pretend or you don't have to hide anymore. It's cleaning it out. And so you've probably been wondering what this guy is right here. It's a tiger, by the way. Somebody thought it was a donkey this morning. I was like, it has orange and black stripes. So it's not a donkey. This is one of my most prized possessions in my life right here. Um, leading up to Father's Day a few years ago, like three weeks before Father's Day, my son, he's 11 now, he came to me, and he had um, a piece of paper, and it had all these shapes drawn on it. And he says, hey, Dad, I don't want you to ask any questions, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to go and get some wood with me, and I need you to cut out these shapes in this wood. I've already measured everything out. You said I can't use a saw, so I need you to cut this wood for me. And so I didn't ask any questions, but I went to my wife. I was like, hey, is this, is this okay? Like, what are we doing here? And she goes, hey, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And so I go and I cut the, the wood out just like he uh, wanted me to. He managed the whole project, and he told me this right here, and this is the size. So I cut it out, and then a couple weeks go by, nothing, nothing. And then on Father's Day, my son hands me this, this tiger. This is an amazing, amazing tiger that my boy Carson made for me. And he designed every bit of it, you know, tacked it all together, painted it, then dressed it up. And he did this because he knows my favorite animal is a tiger. Yes, I love tigers. Now, thinking about Father's Day and the knowledge of me loving tigers, he, he had a choice to make. He could make this for me, he could get me nothing and save my money. Or um, some of you parents are like, oh, I, I see what you laid down there. Yeah. Um, or he could go buy me a pet tiger. But here's the reality. It'd probably be hard to buy a pet tiger. I don't know where you go. Amazon has everything. You could probably get a pet tiger there. But here's the reality. He didn't buy me a pet tiger. You know why? Probably many reasons. One of the reasons is we've watched the show when animals attack, right? And you have watched it too. And we, the Hicks family, will probably never, ever, ever, ever have a tiger as a pet because we've seen when animals attack and we know that this guy's a predator. And sometimes as tame as you want to make him, he looks at you and says, hey man, you look good and I am hungry and I'm going to eat you. And the reality is you can't tame a tiger. He's a predator. You have to get rid of the tiger. And we have tigers in our soul, sins, addictions, unthings that are processed, things that are not processed, whether it be a grief or a loss, emotion. And we're trying to tame our tigers. And it's just a matter of time before they come out and eat us and destroy us in our relationships. And so that's why we're working on our soul because Christ has come to set us free, to lead us into something else. And so confession is getting rid of the tiger. 
It's getting rid of it, saying, I'm not going to manage it. I'm not going to try to put a sophisticated filter on it. I need to get rid of the tiger because it's affecting me, and it's affecting all those people around me, and I don't want it to eat them, eat me, destroy us. And so James says, you confess to one another. And you would say, hey, that's great. I'm just going to confess to God. That, that's amazing. Like, um, we should just, you know, hey, God, did it again. And the reality is, you should. We should get on our knees and confess, God, I'm a hot mess. Help me. Help me deal with these things. Instead of just stuff them and pretend and stop hiding. We should confess to God. But in the context, it says, hey, confess to one another. Confess to one another. Because there, there should be something that happens in our soul when we confess to God. There, there should be some accountability and some motivation to say, I'll never do it again. Thank you, God, for hearing me. But reality is sometimes that doesn't happen. But when we say it out loud to someone who's sitting across the table from us, we say, hey, listen, I'm not okay. And here's why. And we confess, we say it out loud, it becomes really real. It's like where the rubber starts to meet the road and it gains some traction. And so James said, if you need to work in your soul, confess, quit hiding, quit pretending, quit trying to manage it, quit trying to tame the tiger. That thing's going to kill you. So confess. So North Metro, the person you just asked how they're doing, I want you to turn to them now. I want you to confess your deepest, darkest secret. <laughs> Go. Just kidding. I, I, know, I saw the blank stares like, hey, I don't care what you say, Daniel. I ain't doing it. I'm not doing it. But the reality is, that would be weird, right? If I said just turn to someone on your row and confess, you'd be like, mm-mm, I, I don't know this guy. The usher just set me down here next to this person. I don't even know. Some of you don't even have people on your rows. You're like, I got nobody. I got nobody. And the reality is, it, it would be weird in here. That's why we say all the time that circles are better than rows. Because you need people to do this with. And it would be somewhat weird to do it in here because you may not know these people. And you may confess to them and never see them again. And so again, that's why we say circles are better in row, than rows. And that's why we invite everyone into a circle for your own soul because Christ prescribes some things for us that are really beneficial for us and our soul and we can't necessarily do that in here in these rows and I love rows but again I want us to get to a healthy soul because you can only be as healthy as your soul is healthy I mean look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 it says let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some of the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I mean, think about that. He says, encourage one another, spur one another on. How can you do that if you don't know someone? Again, we could try to do that here in rows, and you could give out blanket kind of encouragements. Hey, you look good, and you smell good, but I want to be encouraged in the places that I need to be really encouraged in, the specific areas of my life. And how are you going to do that in rows? You necessarily can't. That's why you get in the circle and say, listen, for your own good, for our health, for our soul, I want to encourage you in specific ways. You told me at that other meeting in that other circle that this is going on. Now that I know what's going on with you, now I can pray for you. Now I can encourage you. Now I can hold you accountable in a specific ways because I know what's going on with you. You, you stop pretending. He started working on cleaning out the drawer, and now I'm a part of your story, and I can live this out. But again, we can't necessarily do that in rows because you may not have anybody on your row. You may not know the people on your row. But in circles, we live this out. Galatians 6 2 says this carry each other's burdens. When's the last time you carry somebody else's burden? You can't necessarily do that in a row, but you can do that in a circle. You can get to know someone in a circle. And they can share what's in their junk drawer. They can come out of hiding. They can stop pretending. And you say, listen, now that I know what's going on with you, I'm going to help carry your burdens. And again, this is why we say that circles are better than rows. Because there's some things that we need to do for our own soul's sake that we can't necessarily do right here. And so we encourage everybody to get in a circle. So pause, hit pause on that for just a second. I'm going to give you a couple of action steps, and we'll link it back together in just a moment. So as we think about working on our soul and cleaning out the junk drawer so we don't leak on people, so we don't explode on people, so we're a better version of ourselves, a more healthier version of ourselves, and we're living from the inside out with authenticity, I want to give you three action steps for us. The first one is this. Be honest with God. Be honest with God about what's going on with you. Be honest. 
The psalmist would write in Psalms 139 this, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so as we start working on our soul, trying to become a healthier version of ourselves, we need to get honest before God and pray this. God, show me. I may have some blind spots, God. I may have, you know, downplayed some things, but God, show me, show me, show me what you want to show me about my inside. Like, what am I not dealing with? What if I haven't processed? What's the root of this? God, help me. And here's the question I want you to ask God when you're honest with him. God, what do you want to show me about me? Have an honest moment before God and say, God, I want to work on my soul and I need to be honest. And so God, what do you want to show me about me. Spend some time and take that question to God. And I know you're pushing back, like, man, I don't know if I'll, I'm ready to hear what he would have to say to me because I know what's in my junk drawer. You know what? He knows what's in your junk drawer as well. And remember that the God that we are asking this question to is also the same God that when Adam and Eve blew it and then went and hid and pretended and tried to cover their own shame in the garden, it's the same God who rolls up on the scene knowing all that their junk is out there, and he graciously, graciously covers them and loves them and pursues them. That's the same God I want you to be honest with. And so spend some time as we're working on the inside of our soul and say, God, what do you want to show me about me? Number two, be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. I mean, that's a hard thing to do, but the reality is we need to take a good look based even what we saw, what God says to us, and say, God, I need you to show me some things about me, and then whatever you hear, take a good look in the mirror and say, God, I need to be honest about where I am. Like, let's stop downplaying that we're fine. Let's, let's stop downplaying that, you know, we've got it all together or it's not that big of a deal because that's our tendency. That, well, yeah, I know my drawer is overflowing and I probably haven't dealt with some stuff, but it's not a big deal. It could be a much more bigger deal than you think it is. Again, the people around you feel the effects of us not dealing with our stuff. And so let's be honest with it. Let's stop saying, hey, it's just their problem. They're so sensitive. Like, they, can't they take a joke? Like, it's just sarcasm. Let's stop downplaying and let's be honest with ourselves. Let's ask this question. Why do I feel the need to pretend and hide my stuff? Why do I feel the need to pretend and hide my stuff? And then secondly, what is that keeping me from experiencing? Ask these questions. These are great diagnosis questions. And you might say, well, hey, I know what I'm, is keeping me from experiencing. I know why I hide and pretend my stuff because if I was honest, this is the conversation I had, we would say, if I was honest, they wouldn't like me, they would judge me, they would reject me, they'd move away from me. You say, I don't want to experience that, and so I'm not going to ask that question. Or I'm going to answer it that way. And the reality is, maybe, just maybe, though, if we were more authentic and we stopped hiding and we pretended, maybe it would draw us closer into more authentic relationships with one another, your spouse, your kids, the people around you. So again, we're working on our soul by being honest and asking some questions. And then the last action step would be this. Get in a circle and be honest with the few. Get in a circle, because again, there's some things that we need to do for our own soul to clean out the drawer that we necessarily can't do here, but we can do it in a circle. We circle up, and we're honest with a few people in our life. Now, you may not need to be 100% honest with everyone in the circle. Don't pretend. Be real. But maybe you don't need to share everything about your life with everyone in the circle, but find a few people in that circle, someone in your life, and you say, listen, I want to be known. I want to come out of hiding. I need help. And I'm going to be honest with you. And a circle is a great place for you to find some safe people to come out of hiding and to do some work on your soul. And so when I think about circles, you're probably thinking, hey, well, Daniel's the group's pastor, so he's probably going to say, hey, Get in a life group. Yes and amen. You need to get in a life group. You need to find a circle. We have Group Connect next Sunday night to help you find a circle. So write that down, register, find a circle. But beyond that, that's not the only circle we have here in North Metro because we care about you and your soul and your health, your spiritual health. We have all kinds of circles here. If you're going through a divorce or know someone who is, there's a circle for divorce care. 
If you're going through a hard time and need someone to talk you know, everything through and to walk through things with you, we have Stephen ministry here. I mean, go to our care page. Look at all the circles we have here. If you're transitioning from college and trying to make it into your career and trying to figure out what does this look like, man, we have circles for young adults. If you're newlyweds, man, think about that. Newlyweds, remember that day? Hey, one sinner starts to live with another sinner. Man, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster sometimes. So, hey, we got circles who can say, hey, listen, this is what it looks like to have a gospel-centered marriage and to make it, to put one foot in front of the other. There's circles for that. If you're a young married, you know, I've been married for a couple years, man, I don't know what it's like. Man, we got a circle for that. Find a circle. Be honest with some people in this circle. It's gonna go better for you and for your spiritual health. And here's two questions I want us to ask as we're honest with each other. The first one is this. How are you? We asked that just a minute ago, and we got probably some fake answers. So the follow-up to that is, hey, no, for real, how are you? I, I wish that we would embrace this as a culture and we would ask this question every time we saw people. Hey, you're good, you're, you're blessed, too blessed to be stressed? Man, don't give me that. Tell me the real you. I mean, asking the follow-up, no, for real, how are you? Reminds people, hey, listen, you don't have to pretend. And pretending is not gonna get you where you think it's going to get you. So why don't you just be honest about where you are and the second question is this ask someone what is it like being on the other side of me that's a hard one that's a hard one but if we're going to get healthy in our soul if we're going to work some things out a lot of us me included have blind spots there's things i downplay there's things you downplay there's things i think hey it's no big deal they should just get over it and the people around us are like, hey, no, it's a really big deal. That sarcasm, that, that anger, that, that you avoiding me, it, it's a big deal. And so I need to lovingly remind you some things. And so let's ask someone that we trust who's a safe place for us, who could help us get healthier. Let's ask, what is it like being on the other side of me? And here's where I want to land this morning, just with this statement right here. The honest you is a healthier you. The honest you is a healthier you. The honest you, the, the one who gets before God and says, God, I gotta be honest with you. I want you to work on me. Search me, God. Help me. Show me things that I don't see. That honest you, the one who can look himself in the mirror and be like, hey, listen, it's not everybody's problem. I'm the common denominator. It's me. I've gotta own something. That honest you and the honest you, the one who can circle up with a group of people and say, listen, I'm gonna come out of hiding I'm gonna stop pretending because I don't wanna just manage this. I don't want the tiger to eat me one day. I need to work on it. That honest you, that is a much healthier you. And the reality is we live in West Cobb. Everybody's got a gym membership. Everybody's trying to look good on the outside, get chiseled, get abs. I've never seen abs. I don't think it's possible for my family to have abs, but we all want them. And if we're gonna worry so much about the outside, Let's do the inner work and say, God, help me on the inside because I'm only as healthy as my soul is healthy. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the cross and how you came to bring us life and life to the full abundant life. And so God, many of us, maybe we're experiencing something less than what we feel like was offered us. And so God, I pray that rather than point fingers and be angry about else, God, we, we look at ourselves and say, what do I have to own here? You gotta pray that we will be people who stop pretending and just hiding and stuffing and we clean the drawer out. We don't downplay it. We don't act like it's no big deal. God, we see it as a massive deal. God, we want our souls to be healthy, Father. You want our souls to be healthy, God. You want us to be clicking on all cylinders. So God, Help us do the hard work of being honest with you and ourselves. Then, God, help us get in circles and be honest with a few because, God, we need each other in our life to help us on this life and in this journey. So, God, give us the courage and the strength to do what you've asked us to do. God, give us boldness. Give us courage to ask these questions. And God, I pray that you clean us from the inside out and make us a more healthy, authentic version of ourselves. We love you, Father. It's in your beautiful and holy name we pray. Amen.
this morning. We have an opportunity to respond to our great God and King through music, but also through communion. We have a chance to be honest before God and connect with him and love him and celebrate what he did on the cross and this abundant life he paid for us. And I just wanna invite you to just come have a holy moment with the Lord and, and, and begin that conversation where you're honest with him about what's going on inside of your soul. And so we're gonna take communion this morning. So if you're up in the theater, uh, you can come as the band's playing whenever you feel led. But here down in the auditorium, you come as the host team ushers you and dismisses you to come. And let's take a moment, a holy moment before our great God and King and celebrate what he has done and what he's afforded for us.
to be God I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me oh Jesus bring new wine out of me oh Jesus bring
North Metro, I don't know how you feel. I, I was just dancing backstage because that was so good. Wow, what a truth though. We are a child of God. Even if you don't believe in God this morning, for some reason you came to church, he still loves and believes in you. And we have the right, we have this privilege of being called son and daughter of God. And I just can't believe the fact that the things that Daniel got to say, this idea of just being in an authentic community. And so I don't know your journey. I don't know if you've been burned ever by the church or a church person. I don't know. But I promise you, I promise you, it's worth to lean back in. My wife and I have been part of a life group uh, for over a year now. And guys, these people have made us better. We've gotten to have some authentic conversations. And I'm telling you, our marriage is better. Our story is better because of the people we get to do life with in that circle. And so I hope, I hope maybe you'll take that step today. I really do. Uh, just to let you know, we always try to give you guys the chance to connect with your Heavenly Father on a Sunday. Maybe you don't know how to pray. Maybe you're figuring it out. Or maybe you just got something on your heart that you just want to make sure God is aware about what you promise you He is. But we want to let you know that our prayer team will be down front. And they would just love the chance to pray with you, pray over you, help connect you to your Heavenly Father. to maybe whatever that need that's going on in your life and in your story this morning. I want to let you know that next week we've got a really special treat, so I hope you can hear what I'm saying because, man, it's going to be a special Sunday. First of all, we have be, uh, built this series around a great, great pastor named Rusty George. He's out there doing Real Life Church in California, a good friend of ours. Well, he's going to be here live next week, and every person who's in attendance next week gets a free copy of his book that we built the series around. So please, yeah, someone clap for that. You can clap for free books. I like free books. <laughs> So if you can, man, join us next Sunday. Get to say hello to Rusty, and you'll get the chance to get a book, and that's going to be awesome for you to be able to take home and maybe read that with the group you're in. See what I did there? Okay. And then the last thing I want to let you know is that we do have the nooks outside, and if you didn't get the chance to see, um, we have an event coming up called Man Church. And as a church, we intentionally try to do things for men, to get connected, lock arms with each other, and not do life alone. And so Man Church is a great event to do that. It's coming up Tuesday, November 6th. And then we would love for you to come out. We're gonna have some great worship. We're gonna have some really good food. I can promise you that. And we're gonna have Pastor Damian Boyd from Vertical Church speaking that night. It's gonna be a fun night for us guys. Please come out. Go to the Nook if you want some more information on next steps. But you know what? It's Sunday. We're wrapping up the service. We've got a community to go and live in. We've got some people to go do life with. It's North Metro. Let's take it outside because found people, we love you.